So what's the point in using the quadric algorithm? Well, let's imagine we wanted to generate the trigonometric functions on a computer. So here's one of the trigonometric functions here, and this is the sine function. And we've got the axis here in radians. Now let's say we had a computer and we wanted to generate this function. Then one of the simplest ways of doing it would be a lookup table. So, for example, we would put a value in for our x along here, which is just the degrees, which are the, the angle, which is in radians, and then we would get a y value coming out, which would be, in effect, the sine of that angle. So we would have one column here, and it would be our input x, and then the other column would be the output, which would be our value of y, and we would just have the value for our x sitting in one memory location and then this will give us point to the value y which would be in the other memory location and then we go to the next point along and we have our next value for x and the next value for y so in order to work with this what we do is we just pick our angle from the lookup table and that's the angle for our input and then we just pull out the angle, the value for our, our output here. Now the problem with this is that if we wanted to represent this function, say, accurate to 12 decimal places, then we would have to have a really large memory in order to represent this function to 12 decimal places because we would have potentially a number between, say, 0 and so that's 3.14, and that number would be coming in, and it would come in accurate to 12 decimal places. So you might have a number, for example, uh, 1.213142789, all the way along 12 decimal places, and whenever we put that number in, we're going to get an answer as well that's going to be 12 decimal places long, so we'll get an answer coming out uh, 0.9133217 and so on. So that would mean that approximately we could say that we're going to have, be counting from 0 to 3, okay, so there's going to be 3, and there's going to be 12 decimal places, so that'd be 3 times 10 to the 12 memory locations that we would need in order to represent just one half of this function. We could represent the other half as well just using the same uh, lookup tables because the values here for the second half are actually the same as the, the first half but they're negative. So we would have approximately uh, equal to let's say 3 times 10 to the 12 which would be 3 um, gig of memory. So we would need 3 gigabytes of memory, just as a, a, a rough approximation, in order to represent this si single function here accurate to 12 decimal places. Now clearly that's not what happens because calculators uh, were available in the uh, 1969, 1970 and they never had 3 gig of memory. So there's something else going on in the background here which allows us to generate these functions. Now, what they used is the mathematics of approximations. So here's one example here, and this is a, a type of approximation that would be used in some calculators, but it might not necessarily be used now because there's lots of different approximation techniques. But this approximation technique is called the Taylor polynomial approximation. Now I'm not going to get into any details of this here in this video. If you're interested, I've put a video on the in the appendix section at the back of the course covering uh, Taylor polynomial approximations. And you can go and have a look at that if you want to. Now you don't need to, it's not going to affect the, the uh, your understanding of the rest of the course. But if you're interested, you can go and have a look. So in the Taylor polynomial approximation, what we do is we approximate the function sine x and we can approximate the function cos x. And we approximate it using the sums and differences of polynomial functions. So the sine function can be showed 
shown to equal uh, x minus x cubed upon 3 factorial, x to the 5 upon 5 factorial, minus x to the 7 upon 7 factorial, and then it goes with plus and it, it, it continues on. And this will give us an approximation. Now you can do the same for the cosine. So let's say, for example, we wanted to work out the sine of pi by 6. So you see here I've put pi by 6 in. So that's pi by 6 there, and, and pi by 6 is going to be 30 degrees because you knew, remember, your pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. So pi by 6 would just be equal to pi up to equal to 180 divided by 6, which is 30 degrees. Okay, so we've got 30 degrees here, and the sine of our 30 degrees, we'll just go up to the, the curve and uh, we cut across and it gives a value of 0 0.5. So let's put our values in. Our value for x here is just our value for our radians, which is pi by 6. So we're going to have the sine of pi by 6 is going to be approximately equal to pi by 6 minus the pi by 6 cubed upon 3 factorial plus pi by 6 to the 5 upon 5 factorial. Now we'll leave out the 7 factorial for the moment, we we'll, we don't need to go into that depth. So that's going to be approximately equal to this here, 0.5236, minus 0.0239 plus 0.0003, which whenever we add up in this instance here, it uh, does end up exactly equal to 0.5. So if you like, you can pick another value along the sine curve and you can put it into uh, this uh, polynomial approximation and you'll see you'll be able to get the right answer. So this is one method you can use in order to generate this function without having a massive uh, lookup table. Now another common method is to have a mixture of a lookup table and an approximation method. So for example you'll have a lookup table with a certain number of the values that we require and then whenever we work out the sine of a particular angle we find the value on the table that's closest to that angle and then from that point then we go through the approximation. But what we want to be careful about is how computationally complex the algorithm is. So for example in this instance here if we wanted to generate the value for our sine function then in this instance we're going to have to go through a certain number of processes so the first process is going to be a subtraction so that's one thing we're going to have to do and then we're going to have to go through a division here so that's a second thing and then we're going to have to uh, do a multiplication three times so that's another three so that's five processes and then a division by the 3 factorial, so to get 3 factorial it would be 3 times 2 times 1, so that's another 3 operations, and so on and so forth. So you can see here that using this a method is not necessarily computationally efficient, that is we're going to have to use an awful lot of additions, multiplications, and divisions, and subtractions. So the beauty of the chaotic algorithm is that it cuts down the computational complexity of the algorithm. Also the algorithm has been deliberately designed in order to make it very simple for us to build a digital architecture which will model the algorithm. So now we know why we need approximation methods in order to allow computers and calculators to generate simple functions. Let's go ahead and we'll see how the cortic algorithm does this.